Welcome to the Where Do Gays Retire podcast, where we help you in the LGBTQ plus community find a safe and affordable retirement place. Join Mark Goldstein as he interviews others who live in gay-friendly places around the globe. Learn about the climate, cost of living, healthcare, crime and safety, and more. Now, here's your host, Mark Goldstein. Have you ever wondered what it's like to live in Oloron, Sainte-Marie, France? Or have you ever heard of it? Well, stick around, we'll find out today. We have our guest, Michael Flatley. Michael and Doug have been together for 33 years. They met in 1991 and got married in Vancouver, British Columbia in 2003 when it became legal. They lived in Phoenix, where I live now, for 25 years before they moved to France in 2021. Moving abroad was always a dream of Michael's. Doug chose France because they used to vacation in Paris every year, but Paris was out of the budget, so they moved to Poe. They heard about Poe from reading a book. It checked all the boxes, climate, affordability, train service, airport, crime, etc., or lack of crime. Of course, the French national health care is a huge reason also to move to France. Poe is in the southwest of France between Bayarritz and Toulouse, near the Pyrenees Mountains, which separates France and Spain. They can be at the Atlantic Ocean in 90 minutes, in Spain in an hour, over the Pyrenees, or in Toulouse in two hours. Michael is a dual Irish and American citizen. He obtained Irish citizenship 20 years ago by the fact that his grandparents were born in Ireland. Lucky you have this in. So... (laughs) Having EU citizenship made moving here easier as he has the right to live and work in any EU country, as so does his spouse. The biggest challenge has been the language. They chose Po because there was not a lot of English spoken there. And I would have picked something where English was spoken. Right. I'm just the opposite. Most people would. I'm the opposite. They did not want to be in the Dordogne and where more of 10% of the population is British, they wanted to be among the French. He thought he'd be fluent in six months, but it's almost been three years, and he's still not thinking in French. He can express himself fine and can have basic conversations, but don't consider himself fluent. He's almost there, but not there yet. Doug has struggled with the language even more than him. However, They both feel like it was the right move, even with the language challenges. There's a large expat immigrant group here in Po because Total Energies has a base here and they bring many people here from all over the world. Most of their friends here are expats or immigrants, mainly because of their limited language skills. Their French neighbors are very friendly, but conversation is limited. We'll get into that too. I'm excited to know a little bit more about that. It's probably worth noting that they don't consider themselves to be expats. They consider themselves immigrants because they're there permanently. They're worried about how welcome they would be by the French because of how they saw immigrants treated in the U.S. But the French have been amazingly kind, patient, and helpful. And we'll talk about that because... There is a stigma of, you know, when somebody comes from a different country to the U.S., how they're treated by U.S. people. Um, Not once have they ever felt less than because of their limited language skills. People have kindly helped them correct themselves or filled in the blanks when they needed it. They feel incredibly fortunate to live there in France, especially in the southwest of France. Tell you a little bit about Oloron Sainte Marie. It's a commune in the Pyrenees Atlantiques department in southwestern France. Correct me if I'm wrong. It is (laughs) is located at the Pyrenees Mountains at the confluence of the Gave de de Laurent and the Gave de Po rivers. Oh my God, I screwed that up. (laughs) The population 
has about 10,000 inhabitants. Oloron Saint Marie is a historic town with a rich cultural heritage. The town center is pedestrianized and lined with half timbered houses. There are also a number of churches and other religious buildings in the town. Oloron Saint Marie is a popular tourist destination, particularly for those who enjoy hiking and other outdoor activities. The town is also a center for Basque culture, and there are a number of Basque festivals and events held there throughout the year. And yeah, we'll get into that a little bit too. It's Basque country, right? We're actually on the verge of Basque country. We're, we're technically in Bayarn of Bayarnese sauce, which okay. comes from here. Mm, I like that. But just outside the border of Oloron Sainte Marie is Basque country. So we're right there. So you're next to Spain? We are just what, about 45 minute drive from Spain. That's excellent. Hi, Michael. I'm sorry Doug didn't join us today, but tell our audience where you moved from and why you decided to live in Oloron Saint Marie. All right. Well, we had lived in Phoenix for 25 years before we moved to France. It was a combination of things. I'd always wanted to live abroad. And, and since I had the Irish passport, you know, I, I knew that I could live anywhere in the EU. And so we talked about it for a while, but it never felt right. Part of which was our aging parents and not wanting to leave and all of that kind of, I don't want to say guilt, but just, you know, sentiments that you have for reasons not to go. But we finally decided it was time that, you know, we can't wait to live our lives on someone else. And luckily we have the support. We got the support we needed from our friends and family that when we said we were going to do this crazy thing. They said, okay, go for it. Got to live that life. And, That's great. Uh, yeah, we were looking at Pau, which I, I had read about in a book, and it was listed as one of the best places to live in France. And the interesting thing was this was all happening during COVID. We started looking at this in 2020, and France wasn't letting people in. We had a plan to come over, check out the area. If we liked it, then secure a place to rent, come back to the States, quit the job, sell the house and all of that. But it was taking so long. And eventually we decided after about six months that we were going to just jump in the pool. We decided we would sell the house. We would wait until France opened. And then as soon as they opened, we would fly over here to a town we had never been to. Um, you know, We've been to France many times to Paris, but never to the south of France and never to the southwest. So we got off the plane in Pau in July of 2021 with four suitcases and a couple carry-on bags, and that was it, and decided after a few days that it felt like the right place for us. And so we were looking in Pau originally, and you know, you expand your search a little bit to see what's outside, and Oloron was very appealing because it, it's a town of 11,000, so it's not a big city. It's not a tiny little village, though. I mean, we have villages here with 100 people, 200 people, and they don't have the services, but we have a hospital, we have grocery stores, we have everything that you would need in a, in a town. And that was appealing to us because sometimes in France, there's places where you, you don't have the, the services that you need. You know, may, may not even be a boulangerie in the village anymore. Oloron was very appealing, and we, we knew when we arrived here that it was the right place. How many times did you visit before making the move? <laughs> We had arrived here on a Wednesday, and we had been emailing with a, an, a real estate agent, one of the very few who responded to us. Email is not a popular way to communicate here in France. It's very relationship-driven, so you normally have to call or go into the office and talk to somebody. But we did have one that responded, and she had a house for sale in Oleron Saint marie It was an apartment, actually. And so two days after we arrived, we saw this apartment. And while we were here, we met some of the neighbors downstairs. And it's a small building. It's 200 years old stone building. It was the, it was the bishop's house for the cathedral here in Oloron Saint marie And the building was converted into four apartments in the 70s. You know, just a, a few people live here. And one of the neighbors was so welcoming to us. Even though, you know, we were foreigners, he spoke a few words of English. And we left that tour of the apartment thinking this really seems great and then we thought about it over the weekend and on Monday we came back 
and met with the agent again and looked at the apartment again and we said, yeah, this is it. It was pretty quick. <laughs> Five days. <laughs> pretty quick. Yeah, pretty quick. Well, kind of sad that we haven't met in person while you lived in Phoenix. I mean, oh. we, we kind of... We lived in Phoenix at the same time. You lived there for 25 years. I just moved here in 2018, but there were a few years where we did live in the you know, same city. So, yeah. yeah, it would be nice to have met you in person. Well, next time I'm back visiting my family, I'll make it a point to say hello. And next time I'm in France, <laughs> I'll stop by. <laughs> okay. okay, tell us, geographically speaking, where is... Oleron Saint Marie located and Po. All right. So if you look at the map of France, at the very south part, you have the Pyrenees Mountains. Spain is on the one side of the mountains and France is on the other. And then if you are on the Atlantic side, you have the town of Biarritz, which is the most probably well known town in, in the southwest. It's south of Bordeaux. Follow the coast to Spain, just stay a little bit north of that and drive about 90 minutes east and you'll hit Po. And keep going, you'll hit Toulouse, keep going, you'll hit Montpellier and Marseille and then Nice and then you're in Italy. But we're very much in the west part. And I was just in Saint-Jean-de-Luz yesterday visiting some friends. Saint-Jean-de-Luz is on the Atlantic. And we went over for lunch and had a nice day. It was an easy drive, about 90 minutes to get there and back. And it's definitely when you look at the map south, look to the east and just go inward a smidge. There we are. You don't have beaches where you are because you have mountains, right? And Correct. Yeah, we're inland a good ways. and 90 we, minutes to the Atlantic, you can correct. get to the beach? Yeah, no problem at all. Okay. Very good. How about the climate? Southern where we France. live, climate was important to us. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts, and I swore I would never shovel snow again. And Doug grew up outside of Palm Springs, and he didn't want to live in the desert anymore after being in Phoenix, too. And you can see so, why not. Right. We have criteria for what was important for us. And when we would look at Po, there were palm trees, but there was no snow. And, you know, but you're near the mountains. And so there's snow in the mountains if you want it. Not that I ever do. I won't. I don't typically go up to the mountains in the wintertime. I go up in the summer. But we found that the climate here was mild. The winters are mild and short. The summers are mild and warm. The average temperature in summertime is about 85 or so Fahrenheit for the high. Nice. You know, we do have hot days. Don't, I mean, that's the average. So obviously we'll have days in the 90s and days in the 70s and, and such. But on average, it's nice. Is and, it dry? No, it's quite moist here. The... Uh, because of where we are on, on the side of the Pyrenees, there's quite a bit of rain that happens. Um, but it's different than the rain. Like when I lived in Seattle, it, it would spit at you all the time. It wasn't even actually that rainy. It just was right. cloudy it was like all the time. Yeah. Uh, here we get rain that comes in and then the sun comes back out. You know, even, even today, we had a little bit of rain around 11 o'clock and then it was gone and the sun came back out and and that's kind of typical. Even on a rainy day, we'll get some sunshine. So it was really appealing to be in, in a place where it was green, lots of green. And I mean, there's farms just outside of town and the mountains are green, they're snow capped. So there's enough rainfall here to keep us from being in drought that some of the other parts of France have. Yet at the same time, our winters are mild. We do get freezing temps kind of regularly in, in wintertime, but by freezing, I mean 32, not mm -hmm. 18 or 12 or right. something like that in Fahrenheit. No bone chilling. Yeah, none of that. And in our town, we don't typically get snow. If we do get a few sprinkles, it melts practically immediately. I, I think good. last year we had three days where I actually saw snow fall and none of which lasted more than a few hours. I could deal with that. Yeah. So to me, that was quite appealing <laughs> to, yeah, I could to be in a place where I didn't have that. to shovel. Absolutely. Okay. So it, it, the, for the climate, it's, it sounds really ideal. It's like yeah. not too hot, not too cold. It's just, it's just right. For you know, us, not, it was the Goldilocks point. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. 
Are there any, like, if it gets really, well, it doesn't even get hot in the summer. It doesn't get Phoenix hot in the summer. So, no, it never uh, was, gets Phoenix hot, but with the humidity, it does make a difference. And we did go out the first summer we were here. We had three canicules or heat waves, three weeks that the temperatures were quite high, almost to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, so we went out and got ourselves a little portable AC unit so we could sleep comfortably at night. But we really have to use it. It was great to any, have, but we didn't need it regularly. Are there any like quick getaways in the mountains that oh, you yeah. can drive up to and cool off for Easily. a day or a weekend? Or Yeah, no problem at all. If you wanted to drive 45 minutes up the street, you'd be in Canfranc, Spain, which is in the wintertime, it's a ski resort. And in the summertime, it's just a really cool town to nice. walk around and, and relax. So yeah, if I wanted to get out of the heat, no problem at all. Nice. All right. I'm just thinking it takes a lot to pick yourself up from living in the U.S. all of your life and just going to another country, not really knowing the language also. So I give you kudos there. It's not an easy thing to do. I've thought about, you know, we were thinking about at one point Spain, but we don't know Spanish. So that was a deterrent. But we'll... Yes, but do you think you can learn Spanish? Because that's the key. It, oh, yeah. Whether you think you can or you think you can't learn a foreign language, you're correct. Yeah, so, I think I can. Then you because can. I pretty much I think I could do whatever I put my mind to. Yeah, so. and I, I say that about French. You know, it's all in the mind, and that's why I have a bit further along than Doug, for example, you know, he struggles with his confidence about learning the language. Me, I don't care anymore. I, I mean, and I shouldn't, I don't mean it to sound like that, but I know I make mistakes when I speak French and no one is bothered by it. Right. So for me, I've let go of that shame of not being able to speak perfectly. And I'm happy just to communicate. Right. Cause and no one's going, Michael, that's terrible. You sound <laughs> like, oh, you messed up your grammar. Oh, I have to correct you. No one does Not, that. In fact, no. when they see that you make that effort, they're really gracious and, oh, amazing and, gracious. and really nice about it. So yeah. Just the other day I was helping my friend, uh, Rick, he's, he bought a house here in town and, uh, he's having it renovated. And we went to, um, a, a home improvement store so he could buy some things and he doesn't speak French yet. So uh, he's learning. And, and so I went with him and, you know, translating for him. And every now and then there's a word that I haven't heard yet. It, and, you know, it happens all the time. And so I'm like, you know, can you say that again? What does that word mean? And people explain it. And they, mm -hmm. No one was bothered by the fact that I wasn't speaking it perfectly. And no one was bothered by the, my accent, which I know I'll always have an accent. And it's funny being the person with the accent. You, you know, I mean, when you're in the States and especially in Phoenix, uh, being so close to Mexico, you have people who speak with a Mexican or Spanish accent. And mm -hmm. now I'm that person, you know, and, and not that we don't all have accents. We do, but even in the States, Southern accent, New York, Boston, LA, where oh, yeah. people know where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> and it is funny, having grown up in Massachusetts, my mom, she worked at Mayo Clinic for a smidge, just to digress on accents a bit. And she told me one time she was surprised that when people answered the phone, that they asked her where she was from because she didn't think she had an accent anymore. This is the same woman who called horses hosses. <laughs> and in fact, I was an adult before I realized that the guy who was on Bonanza wasn't named Horse. <laughs> right. Hoss. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. Exactly like me. Like I'm on the phone. I, I don't think I have a New York accent. And it's not really, it's not a very prevalent Brooklyn accent like people, some people do. Like I have friends, oh my God, she sounds so Brooklyn. But I'm on the phone, customer service all the time. And they're like, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from the Northeast. Oh, we're in the Northeast. Oh, I'm from New York. Oh, we're in New York. No, oh, I'm from Brooklyn. Oh, I could tell. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. For, and and it, I get confused it. for British all the time. 
which cracks me up because, of course, I don't think I have anything like a British accent. But apparently to the French, all us English speakers sound similar, which I didn't realize it would make sense until I thought to myself, well, if I had heard someone who was Canadian speaking French or someone from Haiti who is speaking French versus someone from France, would I have previously known that where they were from based on their French accent? And at the time I would have said, no, now right. I can, but you know, I, I couldn't then. Right. So, yeah. Accents are interesting. <laughs> they are. Is living in an LGBTQ community important to you? Um, I don't think, you know, the size of your town, I don't think there is uh, such thing as a gayborhood or, and so do you kind of miss that from Phoenix? Phoenix had a vibrant gay community. How do you feel about moving to a smaller town with a little bit of lack of that gay community or yeah. how, tell us how it is. It, it, well, you're right on. Oleron Sainte Marie does not have any gay bars. Even in Po, I think we have one gay bar. I think there's a sauna there, but yeah, there's not a, a big LGBTQ community in this area. And I say that, but on the flip side, I know there is an LGBTQ organization, which I haven't yet joined. Again, language confidence is part of that. Also, the French love to protest, and I'm not a big protester, so I'm not sure I want to join a group where I'm going to be expected to go and protest. We'll see. But, you know, it wasn't a factor for us as far as where we were going to live as long as people were accepting. And what's been interesting here is from the gay perspective, that is the most least interesting thing about us. Nobody cares that we're gay. When I say my husband, no one flinches, no one makes any weird faces. It, it is a non-issue. And that wasn't always the case in Phoenix or when we lived in Chandler. Or, you know, it, or especially you, in, yeah, in that area, if you're not in like the city of Phoenix, let's say. Right. There were a few times when I would refer to my husband and you could see you the look on look. their face that like, what? Husband? It, but here, nobody cares. And, and it, it, or if they don't say anything to my face. So I, I feel really comfortable here. And, See, and although the gay community isn't a big part of our daily lives, you know, we have met some other gay people, we, most of whom have been expats. But, you know, we have met other gay people, French gay people as well. See, I think it, in different places, there are different needs. So in the United States, such as, you know, well, pretty much anywhere in the United States, there's a need for gay bars. There's a need for gayborhoods because of the stigma, unfortunately, that occurs in the United States. But in, the, in Europe, it's different in most places. I find by, just by speaking with people that it is a non-issue. So who needs really a gayborhood in France or, you know, where you're living when everything is accepted and there's no hate. So right. it makes a and big difference. And another piece of this is the point of life. I mean, the point we are in our lives, you know, we are married couple. We've been together for 30 some odd years, m most of my life. And it's different when I was in my early 20s and I was living in LA and I was going out to clubs and bars and things like that, you know, different point in my life that was important to me then, not so much now. Right. Yeah. I, I'm probably the boring old gays now <laughs> rather than <laughs> the fun club gays, you know? Well, you know what? I say like we're going out to Palm Springs <laughs> and I crack up because the bars close early and Everyone's asleep by 10. That's me. That's <laughs> like 9 o'clock. I'm out of there. 9 o'clock, I want to be in bed. It's mm -hmm. so funny how... Your priorities age, change over time. As we age, our priorities do change. <laughs> yep. Okay. There is a gay bar, you said, in Poe. Yes. Okay. So, you know what? If you wanted to hang out amongst the gay community, probably that would be the place to go. Yeah, um, and there was also a, a gay pride parade. Uh, the first one was a few years ago, shortly after we arrived. And, you know, it was well attended. 
you know, there is a community out there if we wanted it. Yeah, you probably haven't discovered it yet. Right. Also, how easy or difficult is it to make friends? So I know it's much easier to make friends with the expat community because you have something in common. You know, you come from other places, you probably speak English, but have you had the opportunity to make friends with locals? We do have a, a few, a couple of French friends, but the far majority of our friends have been from the expat community. And really thanks to Facebook, uh, there's a group of that we joined called Expats Po Pyrenees in, on Facebook. And we have met so many people there, uh, both because people were helpful to us when we were asking questions about moving to the area, as well as because we've tried to pay it forward now that we're here when other people ask. I'll meet anyone for a coffee if they're coming to town and have questions. And so we have met some wonderful people, no problem making friends. With the French, it's a bit trickier because of the language. And if we were more confident in French, then I think it would be much easier. But the French, just in general, it's not like in the States where people immediately welcome you into their home. You know, you have to know somebody for a while before you would get invited over to their home for dinner. That being said, within, gosh, a few weeks of moving in, our French neighbors downstairs invited us for an apéro, uh, a, a little drinks, the evening of drinks. And all of the people in the building joined. Everyone nice. wanted to welcome us. And so you have both sides of that coin where, you know, in general, people are a little bit more reserved here, less outgoing, less fake friendly, but more real, real friendly. friendly. Yeah. I'd rather have that. I'd rather have a few good friends than hundreds of acquaintances. Right. And, and my neighbors are friends. They, uh, we had an interesting thing last year trying to go to San Sebastian, which is in Spain, just south of Biarritz. My sister was out with my niece, and I think there were six of us that were trying to get there. And our train was canceled. There was a strike. And my neighbor has a minivan. And I was talking to them about the train being canceled, that we're trying to find another thing. And I didn't ask, but she just offered and said, why don't you just take our car? You know, I mean, these are my neighbors. These are the people who live downstairs from us. And they, they don't know if I'm a good driver or a terrible driver, but they offered their car to us so we could save our vacation to San Sebastian. And that was nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I have my people. You have your peeps. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. That's excellent. It's so important. So important to build friendships and community where you're living. Tell us a little bit about the local economy. What's it like compared to the U S um, what is, give us an example of purchasing a two bedroom apartment or a home two bath, as opposed to, you know, renting and give us a, some examples of utility bills, what you pay. Sure. So when we talk about Oleron versus Po, you know, Oleron is much less expensive than Po. You can get a two bedroom apartment here for probably 650 euros a month, which is like $700. Pole, you might be looking at a thousand euros a month, you know, probably eleven hundred dollars. So it's very affordable. The from a housing perspective, utilities can be high. Are the if you have gas appliances like we do, we have a gas boiler that does the radiator and the hot water. That's our highest bill, and on average, we probably pay, I think, one hundred and fifty euros a month year round do they, they average it out equal payment plan type of, type of thing electricity is our next biggest bill and i think we pay 115 a month for electricity and then you have other utilities like cable tv telephone and all of that that's a bargain we have cable tv wi-fi or internet it comes with a landline as well everyone in france has a landline and really? a cell phone, and it's about 70 euros a month or $75. Wow. It, it is a bargain. You know, that's part of being in a socialist country. All of this stuff is regulated. 
that comes a far way from having Cox. <laughs> right. Cable. Yeah, exactly. I know where you were paying 200 just to watch TV every month. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. That's a steal. Yeah. But of course, the biggest thing for us from a, a expenses perspective is medical care. And I'm sure that was on your list of questions to talk about because yeah, we'll get it into is that. huge. The, 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 the amount that we spend on medical care every month here is nothing compared to what we spent in the States. Yeah, we'll talk about that. So as far as how much do you think it would be to purchase a two bedroom, two bath home? Well, I'll just give you our example from almost three years ago when we moved here. Our apartment in Oloron is, it was 116,000 euro to buy this two bedroom, one bath, you're not going to find two bedroom, two bath here in That's France very often. <laughs> it's hard to find. Yeah, it, it is. But that was kind of typical for the area. I mean, things have gone up a little bit, but real estate doesn't increase in value here like it does in the States. So if you were looking for a house that was two bedroom, two bath, you'd probably be looking in the around 200,000 range in our town. And so cheap. Yeah, it, it is. It's so affordable here. And in Po, obviously, it's going to be a bit more since you're in, in city center. But I have a friend who's selling her apartment in Po, and I think she's selling it for 209, two bedrooms and one bath. Boy, coming from the U.S. to Po, you're not going to be Po. <laughs> no, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not going to be Po living in Po. Right. Yeah, it, it's still very affordable here, and, and hopefully it will be for a long time. How far are you from the Dordogne? It, in the car, we'd probably take about four hours to get there from here. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's a yes, I did lovely a area, but there's too many Brits. 10% of the population there is British, and that was a, a total turnoff for us when we were looking at where to move, because there are enclaves of English speakers there. Total sections of town where no one speaks French and they well, don't even might know as well how to live speak in, French. Might as well live in London or right. back and in the U.S. That's not why I came to France. And, right. and although we talked about the language being hard and, and it has been hard, I am glad to be part of the community uh, and I can go and do my daily business in French. Even though I may not do it well, it's good enough. It's just more enriching too, yeah. enriching lifestyle. And you get much more out of everything, of, out of life. Yeah. So just the Dordogne was language. off our list. I went to visit a friend who lives not far from Nice and Cannes. And uh, I heard so much English spoken there. It was a turnoff to, to be around all that much English after being In here. Interesting. Do you know a little bit about taxes and taxation? So Yeah, so France has a really good tax treaty with the United States. So generally speaking, on uh, earned income or, or retirement income, whatever taxes you pay in the United States, you're not taxed again in France. And of course, contact your tax advisor. Don't listen to some rando on right. a podcast right. like me. But the tax treaty is great because I'm not paying double taxation, except you will have what they call social charges on non-retirement income. So stocks and things like that, capital gains, you may have to pay up to 6.5% on those uh, over a threshold to help offset the cost of, of health care here in France. And Do they have a VAT tax? Like I know Spain has a VAT tax on Yes, sales. but what's interesting about it is... <clears throat> When you look at the price of something on the shelf, it includes all of the taxes. You kind of don't notice it. You know, if the jar of jam on the shelf is two euro, then that's what you pay, two euro. And hmm. you know, you'll find on the receipts how much of it was that versus how much is you know the cost of the items. But uh, I love that about Europe, not ever having to, <laughs> to guess how much am I going to pay at the register. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. How do you obtain a visa for re residency? I know you're, you had an in like yes. many people do. So you, you are Irish, right? So. 
Right, yeah. I'm a dual Irish-American citizen, and so as an EU citizen, I have the right to live and work in any EU country. So that made it easier for us. We were able to come over without getting a visa, and Doug just had to apply at the local prefecture, which is like the government office, within 90 days to say we're living here now. And But for folks that don't have that option, it's not that difficult to get a long-term visa to come to France. You need to show about $20,000, or I should say 20,000 euros in income per person for the year. And even if you have your retirement, your social security, and it shows that much, that's enough to get you the visa. Of course, you have to keep in mind, where are you going? Yeah, you're going to Paris, that's not going to get you very much. You, right. Coming to my town, you can really live well on that. So, All right. But yeah, it's all based on what's the minimum wage here in France because they can't ask you to have more money than they pay minimum. What they pay minimum wage, yeah. Yeah. And if you're coming over as a retiree, for example, they call it inactive. You either have to have show that you're having those payments regularly every month in mm -hmm. into your bank account the last like three months deposit. of bank statements, yeah. Or you have to have enough funds in your account to cover at least a year the, the duration of your visa in the bank. So it's not difficult. And I think a lot of people that I've met here have taken that route to come over and no one's had any problems at all. Do you start the visa process in the U.S. at a consulate? Yes. You don't start at a consulate. France has contracted to a company called VFS. Um, oh. But if you search France visas, the, you'll find the original, the actual government website that walks you through it and what you need to do. And this company uh, takes all of your information because they're in the U.S. They'll take anything in English. Doesn't have to be translated to French, and oh. they'll review all your documents for the for France, and then they'll get someone from France to review and approve your application, and then they'll come back to you with your approved visa stamped in your passport. Takes. It takes a while. I think it took about four months for the last person I talked to that went through it. Finding an appointment at VFS seems to be the thing that takes the longest. And there's only so many VFS offices. I don't know if there's one in Phoenix, but you know, there oh, is so one you in have Los to Angeles, go in San Francisco. Yeah, you do. You can apply online at any point in time, but you have to have an interview in person where, you know, obviously they're looking at you, they're looking at your documents. and Yeah, they want to make sure you're... Right. Asking, you're right, why are you going right to live type. there? Right. You're the right type of person that they are looking for. And, and yeah. they'll ask you, I mean, if you're applying for a retiree visa, they'll ask you to sign a statement that says, I will not work while I'm in France. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. Do they have digital nomad visas? Do you know? France does not. Okay. Yeah, that's, that was important to mention about the I will not work in France because they do not have a digital nomad. You can get a visa as a business owner, you know, if you're a journalist or what have you, but you have to declare that's your profession. You, you have to prove that you have that profession. You have to prove your income with that profession and how that will work for you in France. So there's different you, types of visas out there. Do you know if they have a golden visa, meaning you can buy real estate, 500,000 euros, no, like they do Spain not. Does. They, they, they do not. But at the same time, you only need 20000 in income. So if you have 500000 you're fine. Good point. Good point. All right. How about, is there an arts and culture scene? Or where do you get your arts and culture fix? Like, can you go to the theater? You have to go to Poe? To go no, to we the actually theater? have a theater here in town. Oh. You won't find them in the smaller villages, but we're just big enough to have one. Uh, the Centre Géliot is what it's called here in town, and they have all sorts of things. In fact, in next week, I might go to the Bollywood Festival there. They've got an Indian dance company doing a, a presentation, which looks quite interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And so they'll have different presentations, and throughout town, they'll they'll post what's happening this week and at the center. And then, of course, there's other, you know, bigger theaters in Poe. You, know, you have options for arts. Now, how do you deal with the language barrier? So if the theater is in French mm -hmm. and you're really not fluent in French, how does that work for you? Or do they have, A lot like, of times headphones? you can <laughs> understand what's going on. Yeah, I mean, just through the context. You know, you, I remember we 
we had we were watching actually a, a TV series on in French, and they spoke so fast I wasn't understanding it. And but you know the context, you can see what's happening, and you hear enough words to piece together what's happening. You know, but of course, if it's dance's dance, you don't need any words to right. go along with it. Depends right. on what uh, you're going to see. I was thinking like a movie too. Mm-hmm. If you go to a movie theater, how does that yeah. work? Yeah, some movie theaters uh, will show the movie in original, uh, the original language. Most of the time it's dubbed, though. You kind of have to be on the lookout for the version original. They call it the VO. Um, so you'll see on the movie theater, it'll say VO or VOST, which is uh, the original version with subtitles. So oh, okay. it'll be subtitled in French, but the, the audio will be in English if that's where it came from. Otherwise, you can pretty much expect your movies to be dubbed in French. And I, I'm not a big fan of dubbed movies and dubbed things, but I prefer... Yeah, me too. It kind of annoys me. Yeah, I'd, <laughs> I'd rather have subtitles in English if I could get it or subtitles in French now that I'm good enough to read it to then to have it dubbed. What did you take in school? What language? In high school, I took French. Mm-hmm. Hated it. Hated it. <laughs> <laughs> So I swore I would never speak French again, and look, here I am. Look at you. Yeah, and then I gave up on that for a long time, and then in my mid-30s, I took uh, French at a community college and loved it. I had a great instructor who made me want to speak multiple languages. She was trilingual, and I'll never forget the day she walked into the class talking to her husband in Dutch on her cell phone. And then she turned to a student and said something in English. And then she turned to the class and spoke in French and didn't miss a beat and didn't have to think about it at all. And I thought, Ooh, I want to be that person someday. I don't think I'll ever be that person, but (laughs) you know, we can all have dreams. Yeah. That's a good thought. (laughs) That's a good dream. All right. How about restaurants? Coming from Phoenix, you know, we had pretty good restaurant scene. Yes. Well, I'm in France. You know, French food is... You should have good (laughs) French food. It is. And in our area, there's, you know, we drive along the road and you see the cows that, you know, the beef is there and you see the sheep and so your lamb is there. And so the food here is incredibly fresh and being next door neighbors to Spain, you know, if we're in wintertime, we can still get from Spain, lots of fresh produce as well. That, But we have a market here in town that every Friday farmers come and they sell their wares and there's folks that come over from Spain. And so you kind of buy local. And as far as restaurants go, they'll have the seasonal things. So in, in wintertime, you'll see the pumpkins and the squash and things like that. And And in the spring, you'll have lots of lamb on the menu and things like that. And but the one thing that I haven't been able to get is a Mexican restaurant. That we do not have one in town. We do not have we don't have a good one in Po. And I apologize to anyone who might be in <laughs> Po hearing this that owns Mexican restaurant. But you know, it's the thing I miss when people talk about what do you miss from the states. To me, it's Mexican food because coming from Phoenix, where we had such an amazing amount of Mexican food available Choices. to you. Choices, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it is the thing. It is the, the cuisine that I miss the most. I'm lucky because I, I have found a place in Toulouse that sells Mexican chilies and tomatillos fresh. They, they, they've actually got a French farmer that grows them for them. So I've had jalapenos and poblanos and serranos and tor- tomatillos shipped to me from Toulouse, um, which isn't that far. It's only a couple hours in the car, but it's cheaper to have it shipped than it is to pay the tolls right. on the highways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting good at making my own Mexican food. I'm, I've made corn tortillas and flour tortillas and yeah, all of that. So um, we have to have an entrepreneur from uh, Mexico or the United States come and live in Po or in your town and open up a Mexican restaurant. Cause Quite honestly, when I think of French food, now I've been to a couple of French restaurants in New York when I lived in New York, and I always picture a small plate. 
I don't know. My French <laughs> food, I equate with small and I leave hungry. <laughs> Tell wow. us, is that the same in France or is it just because I got ripped off in New York? I, I think you're talking about fancy restaurants versus, yeah, you know, right. we go to mom and pop places. There's two great restaurants walking distance from our front door, you know, in our neighborhood. And I've never left hungry. And, you know, most of the time I don't even have room for dessert. Yeah. Here in Bayarn, it, it's very, very mom and pop and there's no shortage of food. You know, it's not enormous plates. I, I remember a restaurant in the States something called claim jumper i think it was called and the, they were their portions were absolutely enormous you don't find that here but you will find healthy portions you know good size portions of food if that's what you're looking for well yeah i appreciate healthy portions i don't care for the huge oh my god that they just pile on your plate for a cheap yeah, yeah. that's not me either i want a good quality <clears throat> of food and you know, a decent portion, but not huge. And right, right, I agree. That's what I find here. Yeah, not like, and also not like the fancy New York five star Michelin French restaurants. I can't remember the names, but I remember getting a plate and it was tiny. I was like, "Oh, where's the rest of it?" Yeah, <laughs> no, that's that's your fancy schmancy. I like my simple home cooking that we get here. Good. Tell us a little bit about public transportation. So in Europe on, on, in general, it's way better than, than the States, I've heard. And it depends upon where you are in Europe. If you're in a rural area, of course, you're not going to have the public transportation that you have in a big city. But Europe is more set up as walkable, whereas the United States is very car-centric. So tell us about how transportation is in your city. Yeah, so here in Oloron, we do have, the town itself is very walkable. Uh, I can, I, from my place, I can be anywhere in town within about 15 minutes walk. And it's a great town to walk through. And it's just pretty. We have two streams that come through, I shouldn't say stream, two rivers that come to town and they merge at the library and become the Gave de Oloron, which you mentioned in the beginning. And it's just gorgeous to walk around. But there is a shuttle. There's three shuttle lines that, that go around. But it's not like in the States where a bus comes by every 15 minutes. It's once an hour and the shuttle bus drivers are taking their two hour lunch. So you have to plan your trips accordingly and don't be late because if, <laughs> if you miss the 11 o'clock shuttle, there may not be another one until two. Your SOL. But, yeah, your SOL. In, in Po, they've got a bit more you know, public transit. They have buses that run on a more regular schedule throughout the city. And here in town, we do have a train that comes. We have a train station. The train goes to and from Po. You know, if I want to get to Paris, I can you know, hop on the train here, be in Po in 35 minutes, hop on the TGV to Paris, and be in Paris in four and a half hours. So I can get where I need to go without a car. I think if I lived in Po, I would not have a car, but but here in Oloron Saint Marie, I, I'm glad to have one because I like to go into Po regularly, um, and yeah, being able to do that. It's a little bit more drive. rural by you. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, I could live here in town, but you know, we've met a lot of people. We have friends all over, and so we do take the car and drive because a lot of them live in smaller towns or villages where there's not a train that goes to serve that town, or if there is, it doesn't you know, connect with where we are. So it's not necessarily convenient to live here without a car. Um, is there a train from Po to Paris that's like a bullet train, like a fast it, train? Yeah. So the TGV, which is train, a uh, ground vitesse, the high speed train, it goes from Po to Bordeaux and it makes a few stops along the way. And then from Bordeaux to Paris, it's nonstop. And you go around 200 miles an hour on that leg of the trip. And it takes about two hours to get from Bordeaux to Paris, which is, what, 600 kilometers? So 350 miles, I think. So okay. It goes you can at a stop good clip. in Bordeaux, get some good wine. <laughs> Continue on your journey. <laughs> you could, yes. The train typically only stops at the station there for about three minutes before it continues <laughs> on. So you better Quick. be fast. <laughs> Quick. Get me a bottle. 
<laughs> yeah, there's no shortage of wine here, and it's relatively cheap too. It, it, it's funny when you know the wine here. It's French wine. It's local, so there's you know, very little tax on it. It's not like in the states where you pay import taxes. And you know, we'll find at the store a bottle of wine that we've seen in the states, and you know, it's twenty dollars in the states, and here you get it for five or six euro. Uh, so I bet you at a restaurant you can probably get a glass of. wine. Wine cheaper than a bottle of water. <laughs> you probably could. Yeah. And it's interesting because in, in our region, there are several vineyards that, and they grow wine, but it's not enough to export. So there's a lot of wines that you'll find here that you'll never see in the States because they just don't make enough. But, you know, they're good. It's another place on my bucket list. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good amount of restaurants. Yes. By you? No problem. No shortage of restaurants at all. Good quality ones, too. Good, good. And no shortage of wine. Sounds good to me. Don't forget cheese. We got plenty of that, too. Cheese, too. <laughs> and, yeah, of my... course, bread. Oh, my gosh. You know, when I was in the States, I used to bake bread. It was something I liked to do. But I have a boulangerie 20 steps from my front door. I don't make bread anymore because I can just walk down there and get a fresh baguette. And let me tell you, a fresh baguette here is amazing. It, it, a croissant that's here is nothing like a croissant you're getting in Phoenix. Uh, there, there was one place in Phoenix, sure. I remember, called Essence Bakery, and they made the best croissant I'd had in the U.S. And she actually learned uh, how to make her croissants in France from a French pastry chef. But here, I mean, it's right down the street. Why would I make something that I can just get? That you could just walk. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. Now, you said you mentioned boulangerie. So boulangerie, is it a bakery, but just breads? So boulangerie means bakery. There's also pâtisserie, which is oh, a pastry shop. Dessert, okay. And, and many of them are both. Ours, ours has both. And, you know, you can walk in and the, you can get whatever you want. Uh, it, it's interesting because they know what we like. You know, um, I, for a long time, I was a creature of habit. I'd go in every morning, I'd get a croissant, I'd get a, which is the, in the south of France, they call the pain au chocolat, the chocolate croissant. They call mm -hmm. it chocolatine here. And don't say pain au chocolat because they'll correct you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I'd go in each morning and, and eventually get to be a regular. And they're just like, okay, I know what you want. Here you go. Right. But yeah, you know, they have a beautiful pastry section too with beautiful cakes and all sorts of yummy little treats, things I'd never seen before. Uh, one of my favorites is called La Religieuse. It means the nun. And it's two little puff pastries standing on top of each other. And it has a little white, like a collar, like the nuns used to have. Uh, anyway, it's delicious. That would be dangerous for me. It is dangerous. <laughs> <Living life>. I, <laughs> I don't would, no go wonder, quite as often as I used to. No wonder why the health care is so cheap, because you need <laughs> cholesterol meds. You need high blood pressure meds. Yeah, I would like. But, but we do a lot bread. of walking here, I too. Love bread. That's true. That's true. So you walk it off. Yes. Absolutely. I have to experience that boulangerie in France. Yes, there's That's, nothing better. It's going to be on my hit list. Yeah. In fact, there was a boulangerie in Pau that just won last year the uh, best boulangerie in France. Wow. Yeah. And it's That's a place impressive. we used to go to when we first moved here before we moved to Oloron Saint-Marie and... Uh, because we, we lived in Po for about three months before we closed on this place. And I'd go there almost every morning and get my things. And yeah, it was good, as my you can imagine. Is, my mouth is watering now. <laughs> How about a driver's license? Oh, boy. That's one that takes some, some planning and some knowledge. With France and the United States, France, the driver's license are national. Doesn't matter where you live in France, it's all the same organization that does the driving license. And so if you move from one department or region to another, it doesn't matter. In the States, of course, every state has its own driving license department. And if that state would allow a French person to come to that state and exchange their French license for an Arizona, for example, license, 
then France has reciprocity with that state. If the state would not accept a French person's license and just swap it out, then France will not swap out licenses from that state. So it is something that you have to be aware of. Arizona is not one of the reciprocal states. So for us, that was a challenge. We kind of got around it because when we sold our house in Arizona, several months before we moved to France, we technically moved to Massachusetts to my sister's house. And that was our, and still is, our address in the United States. And in Massachusetts, you have 10 days to get a license from the time you move there. So I exchanged my Arizona license for a Massachusetts license. And then several months later, we moved to France and you I was able, able to exchange. Yeah. Oh so for us, timing wise thinking. and planning wise, it worked out well. Um, I had to have some place, so I might as well choose one that was to my advantage. Good thinking. But if, if you don't come from a state where you do the exchange, it is time consuming and it is costly. Uh, a friend of mine who came from Washington state is in, in the process right now. It has taken her eight months from the time she has started this process until they've given her the, the go-ahead to make her appointment to take the test. And you have wow. to take a, a written test as and well a, as a driving test. Yeah. And so. you have to know all of the signs in French. You do, and you... It's uh, hard enough to know them in English. And you're required to take driver's education. It's not optional. You can't just take the test. You have to go to a driving school, do the however many hours they determine you need, and then go and take the test. God, I need a lot of hours. <laughs> yeah, it's not that bad. You get used to it. Uh, yeah, driving's not one of my favorite things here anyway. I'm the a first, New Yorker. Your, the first few times we drove here, I was white knuckled. Oh my goodness. I remember driving up to the mountains. We went up to a, a place called Gorette or actually went to Artoust, there's a train that's up at the mountaintop and it's the highest train in Europe. And so we drove wow. up there and I was so white knuckled the whole way up and the whole way down and there's RVs coming down the opposite side of these small roads and you just knew you were going to go over the edge and be dead in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> it all worked out, obviously. I'm white knuckled when I drive in Phoenix <laughs> and it's not that bad. That's because... Yeah, I, I very rarely drove in New York. You took the subway, you walked, you took the bus, stuff like that. So, all right. Tell us a little bit about, is there any crime? Yes, there is crime. We don't have a lot of it. In, in my town, the big crime seems to be graffiti. They'll every now and then graffiti something, and that seems to be it. And that was, again, one of the appealing things about this area. I'm trying to think in pool. I remember there was a car that was lit on fire during one of the protests, and that seemed to be the big crime there. So there is crime, but it's not like in the Violent. States. I don't walk down the streets and ever worry that someone's going to pull out an AK-47, and it, it doesn't happen here. Because and guns are not legal. You can have a hunting rifle or things to that effect. They do have to be licensed, but... You know, military grade weapons? No, that's not possible. And, and in fact, we were here probably a couple months in our apartment here, and I was downstairs on the street talking with my neighbor, and a car backfired. And of course, the first thing that went through my mind was a gunshot. Right. And my neighbor saw my reaction and he said, It's just Don't a car. Worry. You're not in the United States anymore. And that was an interesting moment in my life to see I how I reacted to this, what was my first thought versus theirs. And, you know, now if I hear a car backfire, I think it's a car. <laughs> so. But that must have been a huge burden off of your shoulders. Just the fact that it's considered safe, like it, it used to be in the United States Yeah, it, at one yeah. time. I, I never feel unsafe walking <clears throat> down my street or in my town, even at night. It's not unsafe. And even the homeless people, and we have a few in town, but I know them by name because <laughs> I've given them coins and I ask them, you know, what's your name? When I see the homeless person walking down the street, I'm not afraid of him because it's Jean-Francois or, or Christopher or whomever. And I know them and I'm not going to be in fear of my life around them. 
it's a very different. Yeah. Yeah. Because here in Phoenix, it, you know, it, it's different. I know. And I live right across the street from the light rail. So there are quite a few homeless people there and you don't know what mental state they're in. Yeah. It's, that's a good feeling not yeah, to really have is. that fear. Okay. Let's get back into a little bit about healthcare. Tell us about the healthcare system, how it's set up. Tell our audience, is there a private insurance? Is there a public? How does that work in France? So anyone who's resident in France for at least three months qualifies to be part of the national healthcare system. Prior to that point, you do have to have private insurance. So when we moved over here, we did apply and, and got private insurance. But we did it for the first year, and we probably needed most of that because it took us a while to get into the healthcare system. France is wonderful with many things, except anything that's administrative, it takes ages. So you can't apply until three months, and then when you apply, there's always something else that they ask for that wasn't on the list of documents. Bureaucracy. That you originally, oh, yes. Oh, the, the French invented the word bureaucracy. <laughs> and they intend on being the best at it, apparently. I wonder, is it a French word? I think it is. <laughs> 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 but, you know, the, and we went back and forth, and it took a, another three-plus months before we finally got accepted into the French healthcare. So it takes a while to get it. And so you have to have private insurance be before that. But once you're in the national health care, it's amazing. It, it is so affordable. And people pay for their national health care as part of your paycheck. So when you're working and in the States, you will always hear people say, oh, the taxes in Europe are so high. And they are higher than in the States. Yeah, but, but you're you actually getting something. get some value out of it, which, yeah. you know, that's a big thing. And so when... Uh, that's how it's funded is through uh, people working. And so for those of us that came in from outside, we haven't been participating in this. And I mentioned earlier about the taxes. Non-retirement income does have a, a social charge that helps pay for your portion of it. And right. when you pass away, there are very high um, estate taxes that will also fund things. But we'll get into that in a little bit. So the national health care is very affordable. They cover about 70% of the costs, and the costs tend to be quite reasonable. For example, we went into the doctor. A doctor's visit at a GP is €32.50, Euros 50, and they pay 70% of that, so 30% is up to me. 11, 12 euro is my portion. You know, it's insignificant in the big scheme of things. It's less than a copay here. Right. Yeah. And Doug had to have a hip replacement last year. And we went into the hospital and, uh, gosh, I don't even think we paid a thousand euro for the whole thing, including physical therapy. So it, it mm. is amazingly affordable. And that's why when we talk about estate taxes, inheritance taxes, death taxes, whatever you want to call them, I don't mind it because I'm getting so much Something. value out of it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. What are the weights like in the public system as opposed to the private? Yeah, we're lucky in our area because we're not in what they call a medical desert. There, there's some parts of France where it's really hard to find doctors available or services available. And like I said, we lived in a town that has a hospital. That was one of our criteria. It didn't take Doug but a couple months to get in for his surgery once the surgeon said he needed it. So we feel really good about that. It is hard to find doctors in the area that take new patients. We still go to a GP in Po and a dermatologist in Po. Our dentist is just outside of Po. And, you know, you get to know somebody. So I, I don't feel like I need to find somebody in town <laughs> anymore because I like right. who I have. You know, when we first got here, I did contact a couple dentists and a couple doctors, and they, they said, oh, no, I'm not taking any new patients. But, you know, you get to know people, and so people will say, oh, well, let me talk to, to my doctor and see if I can get you in. And, get you in. You know, it's not impossible because we're not in a medical desert, but it, it is a challenge sometimes to find your medical professionals. Um, yeah. But, but Understood. Yeah. we're Especially for people with pre-existing conditions now, the private system 
private insurance, most private insurers won't accept pre-existing conditions. And that was a problem for my husband and I because we're old <laughs> and we have pre-existing conditions. You know, most people do when they're over 65, you know? So tell us about that. I, I don't think they In do In the French accept. national healthcare, there's no such thing. Oh, really? It, it doesn't exist. So oh, once in you're national. in the national healthcare, it, it doesn't matter. You're, you're, whether you've had a pre-existing condition or not is irrelevant. You're in the right. system. You will get treated. And if you have a life-threatening disease like a, a cancer that, that's terminal or even non-terminal cancer, something that, that is life-threatening, uh, there are no uh, portions to pay. It's covered 100%. So the health care here is humane. Yeah. It's not a privilege. It's a it, right. It's not about profit. They run a deficit in the national health care. And that's, again, why when it comes to paying our portion, I'm happy to do so. Is there a reason to have, even though you're in the national system, is there a reason to have private alongside of the public? Maybe if you needed to get into a doctor quicker or, you know, some, I, I know in Spain, some private healthcare doctors make doctor visits, house calls. Yeah, I don't know of any private physicians in our area. As far as I'm aware, everyone is participating Public? in the national health care. Yeah. Okay. And if that exists, I'm ignorant of it. But as far as top up insurance, like to pay your portion. A lot of people do that. There's a, a thing called a mutual, which is top up insurance. And so people will pay whatever it is, a hundred euros a month or whatever to have their mutual cover any expenses. And, but of course, like any insurance, it's a gamble. So mm. whether you use more than you're paying in premiums is to be seen. Right. Right. Got it. All right. And there are a sufficient number you think of doctors to patients. Depends on where you are. In my area, yes. Um, but like I mentioned before, there are medical deserts where there's not enough doctors. And typically you're talking about the smaller villages because young people don't tend to stay in the smaller villages. Uh, you know, they go to Paris to be educated or to one of the larger cities to be educated to become a doctor. And, you know, they want to be in the big cities when they're in their early 20s and 30s. And so you know, there are many places where there's a shortage of doctors. So yeah. it is something that, that you have to be aware of when you're thinking about moving to France is, is there sufficient doctors in the area that you're considering moving to? Yeah. Because if there's not, don't go there. It's the same anywhere in the United States too. That's one of the most important things, I think, at least for us, um, that we would look for a place to retire or move. Does What's the healthcare like? Because we're not getting any younger. So. Right. Yeah, you're going to need like, to be in, the, you know, to, to yeah. get medical care throughout your life. Yeah. So it, it's not a, it, it's not an option. You right. have to find a place where you can get medical care. And I feel like I have no problem with that here. That's great. Do you wish you had something in Oloron that you don't have that you might have had elsewhere besides Mexican food? <laughs> you knew I was going to say that, didn't you? Gosh. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head because I feel like I live in the real France. I feel like what I need, I have. And, you know, if I wanted something different like the ocean, I can be there shortly. I don't feel like I'm missing anything, which is a nice thing to be able to say. Is it true what they say? They wear no pants in the southern part of France. <laughs> I haven't noticed that. <laughs> I've seen lots of people wearing I don't know, pants. That just got into my head. I do that quite often. That. It's just they wear no pants. It was just like a little tune. Oh, they wear no pants in this part of France. Don't mind me. <laughs> um, living there for a few years, what would you say were the cons? The language. I, I, I always come back to the language because it is such a huge thing. And, and I know someday I will be fluent. It's going to happen. It's just taking a lot longer than I thought it would be. Uh, I miss 
my family and some friends, you know, it's a great time to be living abroad because we have, you know, Skype, FaceTime, whatever video chat service you use. Yeah. And so I get to see my people and talk to my people whenever I want to, but you know, it, it's not giving them a hug. So it's not the same. And I do get back to the States at least once a year. I try to go back. Um, but you know, that's not very frequent to see the people you love. Um, right. You will as a foreigner, uh, as an expat or an immigrant, whatever you call yourself, you will have those moments of homesickness. Um, they get, Fewer and far between. I can't say I have them anymore. But when I was first here, it was it was something that I was missing. Um, there are some products that I miss. Oh, do you want me to send you something? Mexican food. <laughs> Mexican food. No, I was just in the States, brought, for, brought home a few things. One of the things that's interesting is, you know, I would always keep a bottle of aspirin or Tylenol or Advil or what have you at home. And mm -hmm. there are no such things as over-counter prescriptions here. If it's a medication, you get it from the pharmacist right? and they give it out to you in packs of 10 pills. If you go in and you say, I've got a headache and, and he gives you a Tylenol, you get a pack of 10 Tylenols. And you know, that is something that when I go back to the no States- And there's no Costco size. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no Costco size. So, so I might bring back a bottle of aspirin or Tylenol or what have you with me. Not that you're supposed to import medication. So no, I've never done that. Never shall do that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but convenience of over-the-counter drugs is, is something that's not, not easily found here because it doesn't exist. Yeah, I would kind of miss that. Like walk into a Walgreens or a CVS and just have to walk into a pharmacia and you know, what get my prescription, nothing really over the counter or even going into a supermarket and not having that, right? You don't have that in supermarkets. No, there's no, no medications in supermarkets. You know, if you have an issue and you go into the pharmacy and you talk to the pharmacist, you can say what you want them to give you. They may not give you that. They may say, oh, try this instead. That it's up to the pharmacist to give you whatever medication they feel is appropriate for whatever situation you have. Interesting. Very interesting. So there are those cultural differences for sure. Yes. Um, yeah. And there's also culture shock, you know, people yeah. could, could go through culture shock. Without a doubt. There's things here that, that are different. And now I'm thinking, what was not normal to me when I came here. And, and one of the interesting things here is the bonjour, which... Everybody says, right? Everybody says, and you have to say it. You, it is the first thing you say to anyone. Um, if you're in the, the grocery store and you want to ask, where's the ketchup? You, you need bonjour. to say bonjour. And you wait for that person to bonjour you back before you then go and ask your question. Oh, Otherwise, wow. it's, it is considered it's extremely rude. rude. Yes. Um, oh, they have to... <laughs> Oh, yes. Bonjour Wait for the bonjour back. back. Don't, you, <laughs> don't you dare ask a question without Ooh, uh, getting your bonjour. I have to remember that. Yes. And yeah, it's funny I'm... because you, I remember in the States, you'd always hear people say, oh, the French are so rude. Not really. It's because we don't know their customs. And, right. You know. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, you have it's to acknowledge true. someone's existence before you ask for them for help. Makes sense, though. Yeah. And like we talked about, you know, with French administration, everything takes ages and the French don't even think about it. You know, they love to protest everything, but for whatever reason, they've just given up on French administration. It's just, oh, that's how it is. Yeah, and it is what it is. We wanted to replace our windows in our apartment and I had to go to the town and get approval from the town, which no big deal. You know, that that happens. But then because we live near the cathedral in town and it's a historic site, we had to have approval from the architect of France and they have two months to respond to you and they take all two months to respond. Um, I'm sure. And, and they said, yes, we were able to replace our windows. But, you know, when I was talking to my neighbors, like, oh yeah, two months, that's not bad, I guess. Well, it depends where you come from. Right. Yeah. So we, yeah, I've learned lot. patience. I've learned a lot of patience. I don't expect anything will happen quickly. And you know how Americans are. Americans yes. are like, we want it done yesterday. Yes. And every you know, time I talk to someone who's something. here 
a new American, uh, that's what I tell them. I'm like, do not expect anything to happen quickly. It will take ages. Yeah. And you know, and I'm the same way. I am totally the same way. I want stuff done like it should be. People call me on the phone asking for help at work and I need to get it done for them. That's, I feel that I got to get it done. You know, there's no, I don't want waiting. I want it to happen. I want a happy person and that's it. But yeah. Right. Well, and like we talked about earlier, the Sunday things being closed. Yeah, that mm -hmm. was a bit of a culture shock when I went to find, you know, get some milk or eggs or whatever it was I was looking for, and I couldn't find a shop that was open. And that's just how it is here. It's fine. It just takes some getting used to. And, yeah. you know, the, the closing at lunchtime and, you know, going down to the hardware store and they're closed at, at right. lunchtime. Like, who does that? Right. They, the French, that's who does they it. Do. And, they, <laughs> they do. Well, and then you pretty much all it. over Europe. Right. But it, yeah. it's normal now, and so I plan around it, and that's perfectly fine. Yeah, all right. Michael, in wrapping up, what would you say to our audience if they're thinking about relocating to Oleron or Poe? I would say come now, come as quickly as you can. It is a great place. Learn some French. You will be welcomed here by the French, and I, I think... If you have the opportunity to live abroad, take it because life is short. You only get one chance and you might as well make the most of it. So true. Hey, my French, I could, I think I can count up to 20. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> it's, it's all fine until you get to 70 and then it gets weird. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> C'est on whatever. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. It's literally 60-10 and then 60-11 and 60-12, but you, you get past that. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, that confuses me. <laughs> it did for me too, until I stopped thinking it of as being 60-10 and now it's just 70 and that's the number for 70. 70. I couldn't even get up to 40. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael, thank you so much for joining us and coming to the podcast yeah, thanks and for enlightening us. Yeah, my pleasure and enlightening us. And it was so nice to meet you. And I hope I'm going to meet you again sometime, yes. maybe in real life. Yes, I'll see you when I get to Phoenix. Absolutely. And when we get to France, I want to visit you too. Look us up. I will. So thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Where Do Gays Retire podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast and consider making a donation by clicking the coffee cup on any page at www.wheredogaysretire.com. Each cup of coffee that you buy costs $5 and goes towards helping us continue the podcast. Thank you for your continued support.